Hi, my name is Linda Karen. I'd like to thank you for joining me today. Today I'm going to be talking about EMDR. EMDR is a tool for not only processing traumatic memories, but also for installing imaginal resources. I'm going to start by saying what I say to every clinician I've ever trained. EMDR is easy. You do have to learn it, you have to be trained in it, you have to practice it, and then it is very easy. It becomes yours. It's just another skill. However, treating trauma is very difficult. In psychotherapy today, the field of traumatic stress is still fairly specialized. There are a lot of things that we did not learn in graduate school. There are things about the body, there are things about the nervous system that really went unsaid unless you took something called physiological psychology, which was an elective when I went to school, and uh, only about a tenth of us took it. But if we're going to treat a traumatized population, it is absolutely essential that we understand the nervous system and understand the impact of trauma on both the nervous system and the body. How trauma remains locked in the body, and unless we address that, we're not moving forward in therapy. I generally tell clinicians this as well. I say if we're doing talk therapy, generally what we're talking about is why the client isn't getting better. That's not to say that cognitive behavioral therapy and talk therapy isn't good. It's absolutely essential. As Robin Shapiro says, every time we talk to a client, every time we argue with a client, we're using cognitive behavioral therapy. No, nobody's dissing that. The problem is it's inadequate with this population. So once we understand um, what trauma does to the body and to the nervous system, it's easier to understand what interventions will work uh, in order to transform trauma. One of the ones that we found that's been very effective and has um, the evidence base behind it is EMDR. So one of the stories I like to tell is about my own training. So I was trained in EMDR a little over 10 years ago in Philadelphia. I was trained by Andrew Leeds, who was fabulous, by the way. So during my training, something fortuitous happened, um, not to the person, but, but for me. I was in a triad with another clinician who, um, when she began to process a memory, she became flooded. A whole bunch of other stuff came up for her, and she actually spent the rest of the day, which was another six hours, um, marching around, shaking, moving all around with the facilitator, all things that you would do to get somebody regrounded. So she came back the next day, but she was basically in the role of an observer for the remainder of the training, which was a good thing. So I learned two things. First, I learned that clinicians have issues. Oh, I knew that. Uh, the other thing I learned was as a clinician, you really have to first assess the client for those skills to stay stable. The other thing is, if the client is unable to ground him or herself, you have to know a lot of stabilization techniques in order to be able to help ground them. The thing to remember is with EMDR or with any other trauma processing method, what we're doing is activating a traumatic neural network. That is, we are deliberately destabilizing a client. So that destabilized client had better have the skills to bring him or herself back down to baseline when the session is over. So how do we know when that is? Well, we do EMDR readiness. Um, EMDR readiness was introduced first by Francine Shapiro, um, and I learned from Laurel Parnell times. Um, I would never have been able to use EMDR had it not been for her. Like I said, I came back to community mental health, and what I was doing with most of my clients after I destabilized them and restabilized them was teaching skills, so self-regulation skills. That is basically what safety and stabilization is about. It's about building rapport first with the, with the therapist and then about building these skills that are missing. So if your client doesn't have the skills to regulate him or herself, that is really where you're going to spend most of your time. Once the client has these skills and if the client wants to move on to stage two, which is processing traumatic memories, then you can do that. I was watching Christine Courtois' interview as well, and she says, you know, it is not, although it looks like a linear process, you know, you go back and forth between stage one and stage two. If you're working with a client and you're processing memories using EMDR or any other modality, uh, and the client is dissociating more, having more flashbacks, um, having a rough time of it, it may be time to when I say go back to stage one, safety and stabilization, it's not like you lose what you had. You go back and you re-resource the client. One of the ways that we resource client is using imaginal resources. 
So it, they call it resource development and installation um, and in EMDR Institute, and Laurel Parnell calls it tapping in. But basically what it is, is guided imagery, um, and we anchor it using an alternating bilateral stimulation. I'd like to take this opportunity to say that I think that um, EMDR RDI is a gross misnomer. And I say that because eye movements, which is the EM, are not necessary as you can use tactile stimulation or auditory beeps or music as long as it's alternating from, from ear to ear or from side to side of the body. So there's no, so it doesn't have to be EM. The D is for desensitization and when we're using it for developing um, and uh, anchoring resources, we are not uh, desensitizing anybody to anything and there is no reprocessing. So the other piece of it is the RDI, Resource Development and Installation. Um, Laurel Parnell points out that we are not installing anything. What we're doing is having a client bring up a memory of warmth, of safety, or of nurturing, or it can come from a TV show or a book that they read, anywhere from the client's imagination. If the client doesn't have any of those, we can develop them by asking questions. You know, where would you like to be? What would it be like if you were there? What would the temperature be like? Um, who would be there? So what we do is we develop what would be um, what would be helpful for that client who's sitting in front of us. We're not installing something from ourself. We are getting them to recall something or getting them to develop something in their own imagination. So when I say gross misnomer, I really do mean it. So if you have a couple more minutes, I'd like to show a little clip of me using EMDR RDI, otherwise known as tapping in with the client. Hope you enjoy it and I hope you come back. Nurturing figure? Okay. Do you have somebody that is a nurturing figure for you now or was? Uh, my grandfather was. Okay. Is there anything that would be negative about using your grandfather? No. Okay. So if we if we have your grand if we bring your grandfather up, I'm going to have you bring him up in the uh, that nurturing aspect of him. Like you know, I mean, some people like if he was cooking for you or he was sitting there talking, whatever. You're going to tell me what what is the most nurturing aspect of him. Okay. And then we're going to going to have you kind of just explain to me what does he look like, what does it feel like being there with him, what does his voice sound like, those kind of questions. And then we're going to just kind of tap that in, anchor that in, and then we'll do a container. And then we'll move on to the memory. Okay. Okay. All right. And again, you have to keep your hands, and you don't have to keep them apart. You just can't have them together. That's all you can't do. Again, you can tuck them wherever you want them. All right. So I'm going to write. Now, the first thing, we're going to start with the nurturing figure. So I'm going to have you either pick a spot to look at or have your eyes closed, whichever you want. Okay. And I'm going to have you, I'm going to just try to bring up a visual image of your grandfather. And it can be just, just your grandfather, whatever he looks like, but then I want you to put him in this nurturing aspect. Okay. What would he be doing if he was doing something nurturing? Um, he'd be sitting at the head of the dinner table. Okay. Whose room? Uh, his dining room. His dining room? Okay. So he's sitting at the head of the dinner table. What does he look like? Just describe him to me a little bit. Um, he's like six foot one, six foot two, um, black hair with some gray. Um, he's wearing his glasses, um, dressed casually, and he's just working on a crossword puzzle. Okay, so it's not dinner, he's just sitting there? Just sitting there. Okay, yeah. where are you? I'm um, sitting next to him, on to the left of him. Sitting to the left, so when you look over at him, what do you see in his face? Um, a sense of, like, love for each other. Okay, so I want you to look into his face. I want you to notice that. Just notice that sense of love that you have for one another. What do you notice? Um, it's just a nice feeling to have. Where do you feel that in your body? Um, mostly in my heart. Okay, tell me what it feels like in your heart. It just feels like very calm and feels like really good, um, just that the mutual love for each other. Okay. And it's a safe relationship. Okay, so if you, say you needed something from him at the table, all right, so you're asking him for something. Can you think of something you would ask for? Um, just to talk and listen, have him listen. 
Okay, so ask him to do that and tell me what he says. Um, he says, yeah. What does his voice sound like? Um, very deep. Um, he says anything you want. He says anything you want? Anything okay. you want. So yeah. anything you want to talk about? Anything yeah. you need? Okay. So I want you to take a deep breath in. I want you again to look at his face. Get his glasses on. Notice the safety of the relationship. Anything you want. Notice the area around your heart. And when he's in his most nurturing, what would he be doing? Would he have his hand on your shoulder? Would he just be talking? What would he be doing? Um, I think hand on the shoulder um, would give me a hug. OK, so either or. You can do the hand on the shoulder first. And I want you to tell me what it feels like in your body to have his hand on your shoulder. Um, just a sense of protection. OK, a sense of protection. So you feel the weight of his hand? Yeah. Is there a temperature difference? You feel? No, just regular body temperature. OK, so you feel his hand, the weight of his hand on your shoulder. And I want you to, I want him to say something to you that would feel very nurturing to you after, you know, anything you need, anything you want. I don't know for him to say he loves me. OK, so have him say that and then tell me what that feels like in your body. Oh, it feels warm, it feels good. Where do you feel the warmth? Um, generally all over. OK. All right, now is it OK if he gives you a hug now? Yes. All right, and as he does that, I want you to notice what it feels like to be in his arms. You said he's, I think he's bigger than you? Yes. Yeah. He's six foot? OK, so tell me what it feels like to be in his arms, strong arms. Uh, it feels safe, it feels like he loves me. OK, so you can feel that? I want you to take a deep breath into that. And I want you to feel his body as you, did, you're hugging him too, I'm assuming. Right? Yes. OK. So where is your hand on him? Uh, mid, mid back. OK. So you feel his, you feel his breathing as well? Yeah. And what do you notice? Um, just our breathing is matched up and just a very tight embrace. Did he used to call you anything? Uh, David. Call oh, you David? OK. In his deep voice. Is there something that he could say to you that would make you feel um, very loved, very taken care of? Um, he would remind me often that he loved me. OK. All right, so one more time, he reminds you that he loves you. Paying attention to the embrace, the warm feelings in your body the safety of the relationship. And just breathe into that. And I want you to ask him if he'll be there for this session. If you need him, could he be there for you? He's able to? He's able to. OK. All right. And now I'm going to tell him that you're going to leave him just for now. And if you want to bring him with you at any time, that's fine. OK, if you want to bring them with you now, that's fine. But right now, what we're going to do is open your container again. Did you want to use the same one? Yeah. So I hope that was helpful. If you have any questions or comments, you can just leave them below in the comments section. Thanks very much.